Alrighty, so today I'm going to take a look at some capacitors and you may recognize the diagram here from one of the other videos because this is showing a uniform electric field and an application of this is in a capacitor. So let's dive straight on in to a couple of important things you need to know about capacitors. Firstly, two key equations you need to know for capacitors. We have First one, Q equals CV, so the charge on your capacitor will be equal to the capacitance times the potential difference across it. That's your first equation and the next one. So then we have the energy stored in a capacitor is equal to half times the charge times the potential difference. And you might see this in a number of forms by substituting the first equation into this. So you might see this sometimes written as half cv squared or if you're making other substitutions there's other possible ones but those are your capacitor basics and those are the two basic equations you need to know so let's move on to talk about actually how a capacitor works and what's happening during the charging and discharging process okay so we're going to look at charging first of all so what's actually happening when you're charging up your capacitor? So let's just draw a quick sketch of this. So first thing I want to label on here is what you actually have in the middle of a capacitor. capacitor sorry. And in the middle of the two plates is an insulator. And this is really important because it stops a flow of charge between the two plates. So effectively, they, they act separately. So you can't get the plates losing charge by having a current across the plates because there's this big insulator, sometimes called a dielectric, in the middle of your capacitor. So that's the first key thing. Okay, so let's connect this to some sort of power source in your circuit. Let's just draw a quick sketch. So we've now got our capacitor in our circuit. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm not going to worry about whether we're using current, conventional current or real current in this. It just doesn't matter. I'm just going to do it for illustrative purposes. So what happens is in your circuit you get obviously charge flowing around it and this charge starts to build up on one of the plates. So you've got your electrons coming out of your negative terminal what I say in the electrons obviously I don't, they're not going right around the circuit but you've got a flow of charge around there which we can model as being a flow of electrons that's not quite how it works but it's a good model to start off with so we've got our electrons coming around and those electrons get deposited on this insulator so you get Lots of electrons being deposited on there. Now, as we know when we learned about unit 1, the electrons have an electrostatic or electromagnetic, whichever word you want to use, repulsive effect. And what this does is it knocks electrons off of the positive plate. So you actually get electrons going around this way, coming off. So what that leads to is for each electron you put on there, you get a build up of positive charge on the other plate which creates a potential difference now the obvious thing here is you know why does it reach a maximum what's stopping it just continuously charging and building a bigger and bigger and bigger potential difference and the answer to that is that the electrostatic repulsion which was pushing the electrons off the other plate builds up to such a large extent that the circuit's no longer capable of depositing electrons on that plate anymore. And that occurs when you reach a certain potential difference. I mean, and it'll be different for different capacitors. But you'll reach this certain maximum value at which electrons can no longer be deposited on your plate. And that's when we say the capacitor has been fully charged. Okay? So... Initially, there's very few electrons or no electrons or no charge on the plates, so there's very little electrostatic force, force repelling or stopping electrons being deposited, which is why you get the maximum current at this point. 
But then, obviously, as you deposit more and more electrons, the force gets bigger and bigger and bigger until... So your current gets smaller and smaller and smaller until your current hits zero because it can't deposit any more, and your capacitor will be fully charged. So let's have a look at a graph of what that looks like. Aha, so our graph has magically appeared on the left-hand side. So obviously what happens is initially there's very little uh, repulsion of depositing for depositing electrons, so you very rapidly increase the charge on your plate. But as the charge builds up, the basic resi almost resistance to electrons being deposited increases, so the rate of, in of depositing them decreases, which is why you get the curve's gradient decreasing until it reaches the maximum charge Q0. Okay, so the thing with capacitors is we could equally sketch the same graph if we were talking about potential difference across our capacitor. We could equally plot the same, except we would say it goes up to the maximum V0 on that one, which would obviously be the voltage you're using to charge it. And when we're charging, we, ha we can explain the relationship in terms of the the potential difference at any given point when we're charging is equal to the maximum voltage subtract from that the maximum voltage times E to the minus T over RC and RC obviously is our time constant so this is your equation for charging and what you'll find is that as T increases this right part on the right hand side basically tends towards zero, so eventually you end up at this maximum V0 part here. So that's charging. So we're going to move on to look at discharging. Okay, so in discharging, you get a look, a uh, different graph. So let's just quickly sketch a graph for that. Again, we're going to put voltage, or we could actually say Q, either matter, and obviously st we still have time on the horizontal axis. So when we're discharging, the relationship is different. It's going to be a exponential decay, so it's going to look something like this. And there's a couple of key places on this graph to point out. Okay, so there's this value here at 37%, and this is quite a key value, because if we dot across, and down, this value here is your time constant, or the time it takes to get to 37% of its original value. And obviously we know, using, you'll have learnt the equation, time constant is equal to the resistance in your discharge circuit times the capacitance. So you, putting those two things together, you can either use a time constant to work out things, or you can obviously read them straight off from your graph as different ways of getting it. Obviously, this time there are different equations to explain what's going on. So if you want to know what the charge is at any given point, it's going to be your maximum charge times by the exponential of e to the minus t over rc. Or in terms of V, it's going to be V is V0E to the minus T over RC. So those are your discharge equations for capacitors. So it might you might be asking, well, that's the time taken to get to 37%, but what about the time it takes to basically get to zero? And obviously, this is an exponential decay, so it's or go, always going to asymptote towards the axis, but you might be like, well, it's never going to hit it. But in practical terms, we say a capacitor will hit the time axis and basically have zero voltage or charge at approximately five time constants. It, we can basically, it gets as close as it's ever going to get and it basically hits zero at that point. So it takes off five time constants. Obviously, you could possibly be asked well, how do you go about finding time constant from a charging graph? And in that case, it's the time it takes to reach 67, sorry, not 67, 63% of its final charge. So you'll, if we 
draw on top of this axis here the charging graph you will find that 63% ends up being exactly the same sort of time so you get them matching up exactly like that so this black one on top of it is the charging curve and I just thought it would be useful for a comparison because in theory they could ask you to get a time constant from either the charging or the discharging curve.